Amen. All right, well, we're there in Matthew chapter number four, and tonight we are continuing in our doctrinal series. I know we haven't been in the series in a little bit on Sunday nights, but we're uh, going to get right back into it. We're going to be in the series for a while. Uh, we're just systematically going through and, and looking at the major doctrines in the Bible, and this is actually uh, part six of this series. If you remember, we started with a sermon on the importance of doctrine. Then we uh, delve into the doctrine of revelation, how God reveals himself to mankind. Then we've been spending the last several weeks talking about specific revelation, and that is uh, about how God reveals himself through his word. We talked about the doctrine of the word of God, and we kind of put, uh, put that uh, theologically speaking and in, in, uh, saw it through scripture. And we had a sermon on what is the Bible, and last time we were in this series, we talked about is the Bible reliable. Uh, tonight, we're talking about the doctrine of the King James Bible, and what I want to do tonight is I, I want to just give you the doctrinal basis for our position on the King James Bible, and uh, I'm hoping we can, we can uh, not be very long tonight. It's been a long week. Uh, it's been a long weekend. I realize you're tired. I'm tired. Uh, somebody uh, walked up to me, Brother Jose walked up to me today and said, Pastor, you look tired. And I said, uh, that's because I'm old. You know, <laughs> I said, I am tired, you know. And, uh, you know, so it's been a long, it's been a long week. That's better than uh, someone walked up to me at the, at the marathon on Saturday and said, Pastor Jimenez, I watch you on YouTube. And they said, you look thinner in person. And I said, thank you, I think. Uh, you know, I don't know. If you're watching me on a wide screen, it's the screen, okay? It's not, it's not me. But anyway, uh, let's 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 try to go through this quickly. So here's what I want to do. All right, I want to just give you a biblical basis for the doctrine of the word of the King James Bible, and then next week what we're going to do is we're going to spend. Sunday night, comparing the King James Bible to other Bible versions, looking at the changes and looking at the corruption. Uh, I was going to do that all in one sermon, and when I, when I had nine pages worth of uh, notes, I realized maybe we need to split this up. So I'm going to give you a foundation for the King James Bible uh, issue tonight, and then next week we're going to go through and just l- compare uh, the King James with other Bible versions to see where they've been changed and how that affects doctrine. Here at Verity Baptist Church, our position on the King James Bible is that we believe that the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved, infallible, inerrant Word of God uh, for the English-speaking uh, people. And I want to just show you that from the Bible, from the Word of God. Some of this is going to be review for you guys. That's fine. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Philippians 3.1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And it's safe to just learn and relearn and review some of these things that we already know to make sure that we're staying in the faith and staying uh, with uh, the the Word of God. So I want to begin just by way of introduction and just asking this question and answering the question, do we even need a perfect Bible? Because today, what you're going to hear from most Christians is that we don't have a reliable Bible, that a, a, a perfect Bible does not exist. They'll tell you that we had a perfect Bible in the originals, the originals are gone, but when it got translated in the translation, there's been mistakes, there's been issues, and you're not going to hear anybody stand up and just say, the NIV is the inspired, preserved Word of God. No one's going to stand up and say the American Standard Version is the inspired and preserved Word of God. Most people out there are just going to tell you that we don't have a preserved, inspired, infallible, inerrant uh, Word of God. And, and except for those that are King James only and those of us that stand up and preach the things I'm going to preach tonight. But we've got to answer this question. Do we even need a perfect Bible? Why make a big deal about it? And, and the, the answer, when you look at it in Scripture, is a resounding yes. Of course we need a perfect Bible, and what's the biblical reason for that? Well, you're there in Matthew chapter 4. Why don't you notice verse 4, and this is, of course, the temptation of Christ. Christ is being tempted, and he's answering those temptations with Scripture. But I want you to notice one of the uh, Scriptures that he gives uh, in regards to his temptation, but uh, he's talking about the Word of God, Matthew 4, 4. The Bible says this, but he, this is, of course, Jesus, answered and said, he's talking to Satan, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. He says, here's how man's going to live, but by, and I want you to notice these two words, every word, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, Jesus said that you and I need an every word Bible. We need a Bible that has every word that God spoke, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. See, it's not good enough to have a Bible that is kind of like the original, as close as possible to the original, the best we can get from the original. Look, we have to be able to open up our Bible and say, this is an every 
word Bible. We must have every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, here's the thing. If Jesus said we need an every word Bible, then that settles it. We need an every word Bible. You need a Bible that is perfect, a Bible that has every word. Go, go back to, uh, go to the book of John, if you would, John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John 1, 1. And I want to do this quickly because we talked about this this morning. There's another reason why we need a perfect Bible, and it is because of what we talked about this morning, and because we talked about it this morning, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it tonight, but it's this, that Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. Let's look at the verses just to make sure we prove it from Scripture. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. This is the second member of the Godhead. The Word was with God, meaning He's separate from God. But then He was God, meaning He is God. That's the Trinity. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. By who? By the Word. And without Him, who's the Him? The Word was not anything made that was made. The Word that was with God and the Word that was God made all things. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of all men. And then, of course, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we know, of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Jesus is the word. Go with me to the book of 1 John, if you would. 1 John chapter number 5. If you start at the end of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and head backwards, you're going to have Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, and 1 John. Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, and 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, and look at verse number 7. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. Notice the Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven... The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. And we said this morning that this doctrine of what we believe, which is what the Bible says, that Jesus is the Word. And again, I want to emphasize the fact, we'll, we'll say, hey, this, this, this is the Word of God and Jesus is the Word. We're not saying Jesus is this Bible, okay? And I, and I, I think... You know, sometimes people get mixed up with these things. We're not talking about the paper. We're not talking about the ink. We're not talking about the leather. We're not talking about the binding. But these words that are written in this book, these words, according to the Bible, are Jesus. And this word became flesh. Now you say, well, yeah, there's the living word of God. That's Jesus. There's the written word of God. That's what we have in Scripture. We understand that. But, but, but get this. If Jesus is the word, right? And Jesus was what? He was perfect. I mean, he was sinless. He was without sin, right? I mean, that's the only way that he could be our Savior. The Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So if Jesus, the Word, had to be perfect, had to be flawless, had to be without corruption, without error, without mistake, had to be sinless, without any corruption in him, in order for him to be the word, then don't you think that this word needs to be perfect? You say, why do we need, do we even need a perfect Bible? Well, here's the thing, Jesus is the word. If he's perfect, then we need a perfect Bible. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So we need a perfect Bible. Bible, and that's what we believe, that's what we have. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, if you would. You're there in 1 John. If you just continue going backwards, you got 1, uh, uh, 1 John, you got 2 Peter, and 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, 23. So let's talk about the incorruptible Word of God. The incorruptible Word of, word of God. And I want you to just notice that the Bible mentions the fact that there is an, a, there is an incorruptible Word, and there are also corruptible uh, words. 1 Peter 1.23, notice what the Bible says, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And, and, and when you study the parables of Christ, the seed is always a picture or a representation of the Word of God. And here Peter is using that analogy. He says, look, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, and then he tells us what that means, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. By the way, this is another reason why we need a perfect Bible, because you can't get saved from a corruptible seed. I mean, that's what that verse is saying. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. 
You cannot be born again from corruptible seed. The only way anyone can ever get saved is from the incorruptible uh, seed, which is the Word of God. So we need an incorruptible seed. We need an incorruptible Word. And the Bible here tells us that the incorruptible seed is the Word of God. The Bible teaches that we can have a Word that is not corrupted, pure and free from corruption. So what does that mean? And, and, and like I said, we've already touched on a lot of this, uh, but I, I think it's important to, 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 to understand it. And in regards to Jesus' Bible, you say, why is it that you guys even believe that there's a Bible that's perfect and pure? I mean, how can you believe that? Well, let's, let me give you some terms, and you're familiar with these, but let's make sure we understand them and review them. First of all, because we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 20. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Excuse me, you were in 1 Peter. I wanted you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. We were in 1 Peter 1. I wanted you in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Some of you were wondering, oh no, is his Bible corrupted or mine? <laughs> He's reading something different. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is the inspiration of Scripture. You say, why do we need a perfect Bible? Well, here's the thing. The Bible teaches that when the Bible was given, God spoke it. Now, we know everything God does is true and right. So when God gave His Word, it was pure. It was inspired by Him. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So look, the Bible teaches the inspiration of Scripture. Anything that comes from God is good and pure and right, without corruption, without error. So be, when you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, you must believe that the originals were inspired. And look, everybody believes that. Go to the book of Psalms, if you would. Psalm 12, if you open up your Bible just right in the center, you'll more than likely fall in the book of Psalms, Psalm 12. Everyone, even the NIV preaching theologians, will say, hey, yeah, in the originals, those were inspired by God, those were perfect. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But we also believe in the preservation of Scripture. Psalm 12, look at verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. That's inspiration. Anything that God brings forth, it's right, it's good. His words are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. But I want you to notice, in verse 7, now we're not learning about inspiration, now we're learning about preservation. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now most people today, they'll tell you, yes, the originals were inspired, but the translations have been corrupted. They believe in the inspiration, but they don't believe in the preservation. The Bible says that it is God's job to preserve his word. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Go to Psalm 119 if you would. And look, think about this. Because we've spent time talking about the Bible and the history of the Bible and practically and logistically speaking, we've talked about the fact that, that God gave us his word, right? Over a period of 1,500 years, uh, some people think a little more, some people think a little less, but over a period of 1,500 years, over a period of a long time, God used 40 different writers on three different continents in three different languages. He used his Holy Spirit to inspire his words. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now just think about this. Why would God spend 1,500 years, 40 writers, His Holy Spirit, three continents, three languages, to give us the inspired, preserved Word of God, used fallible man, used sinful man in the process of inspiration to give us His Word, just so that in the next generation, when they began to translate it, it would be lost? I mean, wouldn't that just be a divine waste of time? That would be foolishness. Look, if you believe in inspiration, holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost, the words of the Lord are pure words, then you must also believe in preservation. The same God who's powerful enough to use sinful man to give us pure words can use sinful man to preserve those words. See, we believe in the inspiration and the preservation of Scripture. And because we believe those things, we believe that there must be an every word Bible on this earth today. We believe that there must be 
an inspired, preserved word of God, an incorruptible word. Psalm 119, are you there? Look at verse 89. Forever, O Lord. Forever, O Lord. Psalm 119 and verse 89. The Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Look, in heaven there's no debate as to which one is the word. And on this earth, people debate. And look, if you're not sure about the King James issue, I'm going to give you the theological view and the, the foundation tonight. You make sure you come back next week, and we're going to actually open up the NIV. We're actually going to open up the New King James. We're actually going to open up the New American Standard. We're actually going to open up the English Standard Version. And we're going to open up a King James Bible. And we're just going to read them and actually compare them. And look, you, you would have to be, just be blind to not be able to see the differences in the, in the, that, that they are corrupted, that they've removed verses, all those things. We're going to actually compare them, and it'll be settled not just in heaven. It'll be settled here as well. It'll be clear. But look, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We believe in the inspiration of Scripture. We believe in the preservation of Scripture. Let me give you two more terms, though, that I would like you to be uh, familiar with, and they are this. Inerrancy. We believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And infallibility. We believe that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. We believe in the inspiration and the preservation of Scripture, but we believe that the Bible is inerrant and it is infallible. Are you there in Psalm 119? Look at verse number 160. Psalm 119 and verse number 160. Notice what the Bible says Thy word is true. Psalm 119, verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The Bible says thy word is true. You don't have to turn there, but in John 17 and verse 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, we not only believe that the Bible is inspired and it is preserved, we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that it is inerrant, and then in the infallibility of Scripture, that it is infallible. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you a couple definitions. The word inerrant or inerrancy means that we believe that the Bible is without error. Thy word is true. There's nothing wrong in the Bible. It's always right. There's nothing uh, wrong with what the Bible says there. It's without error. Now, the word infallible is closely tied to the word inerrant, but it's a little different. The word inerrant means that we believe that the Bible is without error. The word infallible means that we believe that the Bible is incapable of being found wrong. You cannot find a contradiction in the Bible. And whenever people find a so-called contradiction in the Bible, it's just a contradiction in their understanding. And look, the the Bible was written thousands of years ago, and just history continues to prove it right. I mean, thousands of excavations, thousands of of, of cities and towns and, and, and historical places have been dug up, and they always prove, even when it seems like the Bible is at odds with history, eventually history catches up to the Bible. Eventually, science catches up to the Bible. Eventually, society catches up to the Bible because the Bible is inspired. It came from God. It's preserved. We still have the words of God. Therefore, it's inerrant. There's no error. And it's not only inerrant, it's also infallible, meaning it's incapable of ever being proved wrong. It's not like, oh, well, it's inerrant now based on what we know, but when the aliens come from Mars... Then we'll know it was wrong. No, it's nothing that would ever contradict the Bible. Will let you, they're never coming. The aliens are not coming, all right? You've been listening to too many dispensationalists. It's infallible. It's incapable of being found wrong. So the incorruptible word, what is it? Inspired, preserved, inerrant, infallible. Let's talk about the corrupted word or the corrupted versions of the word of God. Go to 2 Corinthians, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm not sure if you kept your place in John. I had you in John, but you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and we're not going to be very long tonight because like, like I told you, I had this, the sermon was going to be half of this and half of just going through verses and comparing. I decided to split those up because, like I said, I had 11, 11 pages worth of notes, and that's just more than I think we can handle. 
on, especially on a weekend like this. It's been busy, so let's, let's just look at this, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be done here soon. 2 Corinthians 2, look at verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. For we are not as many. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth in the first century. We believe that the, Bible, the New Testament was written, completed by 70 A.D. Even scholars who disagree with that, no one disagrees. The, most people agree that the, Bible was, the New Testament was completed by 100 A.D., at the latest, 120 A.D. Here we have the Apostle Paul writing with, within the, the time span of 33 A.D. to, I believe, 70 A.D., some people might say 100 A.D., others might say 120 A.D., but I mean within a relatively short amount of time since the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And Paul says, for we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. You know what that proves? That proves that even during the time and the life of the Apostle Paul, when the New Testament was still being written, before the New Testament had even been completed, there were already those who were corrupting the Word of God. Now, this is important to understand because today, when we look at the modern Bible versions, and we'll cover this next week, they'll point to some old manuscript, and they'll say, well, this is an old manuscript, this uh, Vaticanus, this, you know, whatever, this is older than what you have, so therefore it must be better. It must be uh, 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 more accurate. It must be, but look, it, this verse proves to us that it doesn't matter how old a manuscript is because even before the New Testament was completed, there were manuscripts that were corrupted. He says, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Look, the Bible has been under attack and the word of God has been under attack from the beginning. So look, when it comes to corrupted versions, are there corrupted versions of the word of God? Absolutely. Not everything that calls itself a Bible is a Bible. By the way, not everything that calls itself a Christian is a Christian. There are corrupt versions. And people say, oh, well, this is an old manuscript. Well, look, you, you can find, according to Paul, you can find a manuscript, you know, within 70 A.D. to 120 A.D., and it would be corrupt because even before the New Testament was done, people were already corrupting the Word of God. Go to Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3, first book in the, first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. Now, sometimes people ask this question, why are there so many Bibles? I mean, why do you go to the Balaamite bookstore, the, the Christian bookstore, and you just got all the, the NIV, the New King James, the ESV, the, you know, whatever. You have all these versions. Why are there so many corrupted Bibles? Well, look, Satan has been attacking the Word of God from the beginning. Literally. I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll, look, I'll show it to you here in, in Genesis. Genesis 3, we have the famous passage of Adam and Eve and the fall of man. Genesis 3, look at verse 1. Now the serpent, this is Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, notice what he says to the woman. This is what Adam, uh, what, what, oh, excuse me, Satan says to Eve. He says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want you to notice, the first time we see Satan speak in the Bible, he's questioning the word of God. I mean, because God said, hey, you can eat of any tree, but not this one. Not this one tree. And then Satan says, you know, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And look, from the beginning, he begins to question the word of God. Notice her response. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruits of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Notice verse 4. And the serpent, that's Satan, said unto the woman. Notice, here's the second thing he says in all of Scripture. First thing he says, questions the word of God. Second thing he says, changes the word of God. He says, ye shall not surely die. Now look, God said ye shall die. He says, ye shall not surely die. You say, oh, well, what's the big deal? He just added one word. Yeah, he added the, the small word not, but that changed the entire meaning. He says, ye shall not surely die. And then, of course, he begins to teach us Mormonism. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And he begins to teach his satanic religion. But look, 
From the be- I'm showing you that from the very beginning, Satan has been questioning the Word of God, corrupting the Word of God, changing the Word of God. Before the New Testament's even completed, Paul says, we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. So there's been a t- an attack on the Bible. There's been an attack on the Word of God. Go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. And, and while you go there, I, I want to just read to you a list. One of the most popular Bible, uh, new uh, Bible versions out there is the NIV, the New International Version. And, uh, and, and, and what I'm going to show you here is, is, is true of many new modern Bible versions. But the, the NIV, and next week we're going to sit there and we're going to co- compare all these Bible versions and, and look at the verses together. But I just want you to notice that the NIV removes 16 entire verses from the New Testament. 16 just complete verses are, are just gone. If you have an NIV and you go to these passages, you know, I'll get, let me, let me, I'm, I'm going to listen for you and I'll read them for you. Here's, here's one verse that's missing um, from the NIV, Matthew 17, 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. If you have an NIV, here's how your NIV will look. It'll be Matthew 17, you'll have verse 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24. The NIV can't even count. It just removes verse 21. And it's, isn't it interesting that verse 21 is a verse where Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, you know what? Sometimes the devil's a little stronger and there's just a little extra, a few extra things you need to do to be able to overcome and, and beat the devil. How be it this kind, go not out, but by prayer and fasting. And the devil's like, yeah, let's take that out. Let's make sure people don't know about that. Here's another one, Matthew 18, 11. For the, man is come, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Satan's like, eh, we don't need that one. Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a precept make long uh, pre, a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. He's like, oh man, he's ripping on my guys here. Let's remove that one. Mark seven, uh, Mark chapter seven, verse sixteen. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. He's like, ah, oh, you don't need that. Mark nine forty four. I won't read all these. Mark nine forty four. Mark nine forty six. Mark eleven twenty six. Mark fifteen twenty eight. Luke seventeen thirty six. John 5, 4, Acts 8, 37, Acts 8, 37, where, the, where the, uh, the, the Ethiopian is asking Philip, you know, here's water, what does hinder me to be baptized in, in verse 36? And then in verse 37, the Bible says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Satan says, let's remove that. So when you read the NIV, you've got uh, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch asking, what does hinder me to be baptized? And then verse 37 is gone. In verse 38, he's getting baptized. Apparently nothing's hindering you from getting baptized. Anybody can get baptized. Just removes verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Acts 15, 34, gone. Acts 24, 7, gone. Acts 28, 29, gone. Romans 16, 24, gone. 1 John 5, 7. I mean, the most important verse in Scripture regarding the Trinity, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, gone. And and here's what I'm telling you. You say, why are they gone? Because Satan wants to corrupt the Bible. And look, this is true of many modern Bible versions. And these are just the verses that are completely gone. There are many other passages where they just remove a sentence, where they just remove a part of a verse, or they'll remove the, the, the latter part of one verse and the first part of another verse, and it's like equivalent to an entire verse. These are just actual verses that are removed that if you look at the numbers, it's going to go 14, 15, seven, uh, 17. It's going to go 35, 36, 38. I mean, 16 verses removed. You say, well, you know, what's the big deal? Well, notice what the Bible says in the book of Revelation in uh, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, look at verse 18. Now look, this is, in the la- this is at the end of the last book of the Bible. And God is speaking this not just about the book of Revelation, but about the entire Bible. Revelation 22:18. 18. For I testify unto every man 
that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things. Now, what, what is that? That's like Joseph Smith with his Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ? No, you're adding to the Word of God. That's, that's Muhammad with his Quran. He says, look, if any man shall add unto these things, what does God think about this? God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? There's a lot of nasty plagues. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff. And God, God says, here's how I feel about people who add things to my word. Then he says this, verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Look, the, the editors of the NIV who took out 16 entire verses from the New Testament, this is what God is talking about. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Now, what does that mean? Look, it doesn't mean that these people lost their salvation. Nobody loses their salvation. What it means is that God is going to remove the part of the book of life where their name would have been or could have been or should have been. He's going to remove that so that their name cannot be there. What is that? Th Look, what the this is teaching that anyone who messes with God's word instantly becomes a reprobate. They lose their opportunity to be saved. And look, anyone who would mess with the Word of God is not saved. You say, oh, well, what if they were saved? They wouldn't mess with God's Word. Jesus said that if you're His, you hear His voice. You follow Him. You know what the Word is. You know what the Bible is. Here it says, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Look, the Bible uh, has been under attack. It's been corrupted. People are trying to change it. People are trying to remove parts from it. And we need to realize that there must be, there has to be a perfect Bible because God inspired it. God preserved it. Jesus said we need every word. Jesus is the word. And we need the incorruptible word of God in order to be saved. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to look at two more verses and we'll, we'll finish up. Excuse me, three more verses. Two in, one in Isaiah and two in Matthew. Isaiah chapter 40. Look at verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40, towards the end of the Old Testament, you've got the major prophets. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. The Bible says this, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Look, the Bible, look God said His word will stand forever. So these people who say, Oh no, we don't have the word of God. Well, then they're calling God a liar. Because God said his word will stand forever. He, he says, look, yes, the grass withers, the flower fades, things that are not eternal, they corrupt. But he said, my word is going to stand forever. It will always be. It will never not be. We must have an every word Bible. So where is it? I mean, which one is it? And we'll answer that uh, next week as we compare the King James with other places. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You know, it, it's the best, way, the best way to know whether something is, is what it truly is is to compare it with that which is fake. Whether it's a dollar bill, comparing a real dollar bill to a, a counterfeit, whether it's comparing a real diamond to a counterfeit, when you put them side by side, it becomes very clear which one's real and which one's not. And with the Bible, it's the same way. You put the King James next to any one of these, and you start looking at them, it becomes very clear which one is the Word of God. Matthew 5, 18. Notice what the Bible says. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Look, the Bible must stand. The Bible will stand. They'll, they'll try to get rid of the Bible. They'll never succeed. So do we need a perfect, inspired, preserved, and inerrant, infallible Bible? Yes. We must have one on this earth today, or God is a liar. Matthew chapter 4. Go back to Matthew 4 where we started. Matthew chapter 4. We believe the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved Word of God. And I encourage you to be with us next week. We'll look at it. We'll study it. It'll be clear. It'll, it'll be super clear. And we'll take time. I didn't want to rush it tonight and just kind of rush through it. I want to be able to take our time and go through and have you look at, read your King James, and we'll have guys up here reading from the other versions, and it'll be clear. 
But you know, on a personal level, remember I told you this morning that your doctrines will affect your deeds, what you believe will affect your actions. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, notice what he said. We started there this evening. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, just on a personal level as a Christian, for all of us, and, and I know for me as a pastor, for my wife as a pastor's wife, we, we need to know, we need to be assured that this Bible that I'm holding right now, that these words that I'm holding, that, that I read, these words that, that I've underlined and I've made notes of and I've studied, these things that we've given our lives to studying and learning, we have to have the assurance that this is the Word of God and that there's no error in here. I mean, you, you know what I mean? Like, as a pastor, I stand up every week, and I tell people and I teach people, thus saith the Lord God. This is what the Bible says. This is what God wants you to do. This is how God wants you to do As a pastor, I sit in that office, and I look across the table at people with real issues and real burdens and real problems, and they need real solutions. And I can't just sit there and say, well, here's what I think you should do. Here's what might work. Here's what God might want you to do. I mean, I'm not really sure because I'm not even sure if this is legit. Look, you and I, I can't raise my kids on maybe. I need to raise my kids on yes. This is the Bible. This is the word. It's inerrant. It's infallible. I can trust the Bible. You say, why is it that these lame churches are just not preaching hard? They're not being authoritative. They're not. Well, look, I wouldn't be either if I was just guessing at it. If I, if I wasn't even sure if this was the Bible, I'd be like, well, you know, I don't know. Let me give you a verse and kind of fill my sermon with a bunch of stories and jokes and poems because I'm not even sure if this is legit. You say, why do you guys preach the Bible so much? Why do you have so much Bible? Because we believe this thing. Because we believe that this will actually bring salvation. We believe that this will bring the abundant life that God promised. We believe that this will save your marriage. It will help your children. It will help your finances. It will help your health. It will help you in every relationship of life. Because it's true. And when we say it, and when we preach it, and when we uh, thunder it forth, and the world says, ah, that will never work. That whole marriage thing, that won't work. We have to be able to stand up and say, yes, it will. Because it's the word of God. That whole child rate, the spanking and discipline, uh, really? Dr. Spock said to give him a timeout. This is the word of God. This is inerrant. It's infallible. You can trust it. You, you, look, you can put all your eggs in this basket. It won't let you down. Because it is the inspired, the preserved, the inerrant, the infallible word of God. It'll never let you down. It'll always give you the right answer. And look, if I didn't believe it, I want to stand up here and tell you. If I didn't think that this was actually what God said, if I wasn't convinced that everything this Bible says is true, I would not base my life and I would not bet your life on it. But our doctrines affect our actions. And you've got to be settled This is what God spoke. This is what God said. This is what God has. This is what God wants for you and for me. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that sometimes we have to open up this Bible and see some hard things, some negative things, some things that are difficult. But we can always trust that it's true that it won't lead us astray, that it is inerrant and it is infallible, it is inspired and it is preserved. You said we'll live by this word. Lord, help us to be convinced of the fact that we have an every word Bible. And Lord, help our doctrine to affect our deeds. Help us to live in a way that shows that we trust you And we trust your word. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.